This may be a familiar scenario. You're on Amazon, eyeing this $90 camera bag from San Francisco startup Peak Design. Probably our best-selling bag of all time. Before you hit buy now, you notice a similar listing for a third of the price. You don't have to pay for all those needless bells and whistles, like years of research and development, recycled blue sign approved materials, a lifetime warranty, fairly paid factory workers, and total carbon neutrality. Instead, you just get a bag designed by the crack team at the Amazon Basics Department. Peak Design made this snarky video when it noticed Amazon had made a private label copy of its bag. And Amazon's gotten a lot of flack for this type of practice, including a lawsuit from California and proposed federal legislation that would limit the power of tech monopolies, a topic so hot John Oliver recently devoted a whole segment to it. Amazon has a huge advantage over its competitors because it runs the marketplace and has access to all the independent seller data, like, I don't know, hypothetically, Aesthetically, what bag is proving popular. So what exactly is a private label? How does it work? And despite rumors that it considered shutting them down to appease regulators, Amazon says it's continuing to invest in its own brands. There's no chance in hell that Amazon pulls back and pulls down its Amazon batteries, Amazon Basics product. It's just doing too well. This is the story of Amazon's 118 plus private label brands, some that carry the Amazon name and others cleverly disguised without it. And why experts say, despite big antitrust allegations, the age old model is going nowhere. A private label is the same thing as a store brand. Essentially, a retailer will find a manufacturer to make an affordable version of a branded product. The retailer has its own branding put on the blank white label, then sells it for an average of 25 to 40 percent less than the national brand name product, and sometimes way cheaper. The history of private label, in the US anyway, is very much a perception of low price and, at best, acceptable quality. Retailers eager to break from that perception develop lines with a particular focus, like Safeway's O Organics or Kroger's Comfort's Baby line. Others put most of their products under store brands like Walmart's Great Value, Equate, and Sam's Choice, or Costco's Kirkland Signature. In other cases, store names double as brand names, like CVS and Trader Joe's. For Amazon, there's likely a reason some of its 100-plus brands carry its name and others don't. Their first initiatives in private label did all have the Amazon name on them. And they had some quality control issues, as have other retailers. And I am speculating here that they have decided, no, we're not just going to go in and put the Amazon name on stuff because we can't risk damaging that. Amazon first entered the private label business around 2009 with its Amazon Basics brand of staple goods like power cords and its ever popular batteries, with prices often way lower than Energizer or Duracell. Amazon's private label business has grown dramatically over you know, recent years. They now have over 200,000 private label products and a whole bunch of house brands. Who makes these cheaper, generic versions is purposely shrouded in mystery. Neither the retailer nor the manufacturer who supplies them want to boast about the fact that they're supplying private labels, especially if you're a national brand manufacturer. Like with anything that's kept quiet, rumors abound. Grey Goose says no, it doesn't make Costco's Kirkland Signature Vodka. But are Oreos and the Wegmans version made by the same factory? Does Duracell manufacture Amazon Basics batteries? Your guess is as good as mine. Kasum Elawadi has been researching private labels for about 25 years. Here's what she says we do know about who makes private label goods. There are some national brand manufacturers who use their excess capacity or even have a whole production facility that does private label. There are also some large private label only specialty firms whose whole business is doing private label. And some retailers have their own manufacturing facilities. Amazon released a list of more than 100 suppliers in 2019, but declined to answer when we asked who makes its private labels now. Not much is spent on the packaging and the promotion and the marketing of it. It's simple, core, base product at a very, very good price. While store brands cost customers far less, Elowati says they bring in around 25% higher profit margins for retailers than national brands. There is nothing anti-competitive about comparing one product with another and saying that these products are very similar and I'm selling you one at a lower price. Some would argue, and I would agree with that, that that is as competitive as it gets. Elowati says this business model dates back at least to the 50s. But private labels had their first big moment in the 70s. After a recession and a decade of high inflation, consumers wanted cheaper products. 
retailers started offering generics with monochrome labels like dog food and orange-flavored drink. Generics, the no-frills value choice from Eagle, the food experts. Private labels have come a long way in 40-plus years. Although store brand popularity died down with good economic times, private labels are back in vogue amid soaring inflation and fears of a recession. There's now a whole segment of shoppers devoted to private labels like Aldi and Trader Joe's. They're trying to differentiate much more, create private label products that are, that are more innovative, that they can claim are special. They branded it Amazon Basics right on the box, like as if they, they want you to be proud that you bought an Amazon Basics product. But for Amazon's $30 everyday sling bag, it appears the goal was imitation over differentiation. This trapezoidal logo badge, same positioning on the right side of the bag. Owning the brand lets Amazon or any retailer cut corners compared to a pricier brand name product. They're just floppy garbage, you know? I don't know if they'll protect a camera, maybe they will. Just the difference between a quality product and a knockoff quality product. By making a private label for less, retailers then pass those savings on to customers, which in turn can lead to more sales. Elawadi says private labels typically make up 25 to 30 percent of sales volume for major retailers. Across grocery, household, and health and beauty items, a whopping 77 percent of Aldi's sales are from private label items, followed by Trader Joe's at 59 percent and Wegmans at 49 percent. Costco is at 33 percent and Target 15 percent. Amazon is significantly lower at just 3 percent, although its Amazon Basics brand came in third for fastest growing private label. Overall, Amazon reportedly has said its in-house brands only make up about 1% of retail sales, although that number is still likely in the billions, with Amazon's revenue in 2021 nearing $470 billion. On the flip side of big sales for an Amazon-owned product is the potential for it to take sales away from the product it resembles. Peak design was well established by the time Amazon copied its bag, but that's not the case for millions of its third-party sellers who often rely entirely on selling their goods on Amazon. You know, if Amazon had done this to the original Peak Design camera clip, I mean, it could have smoked the business. Could have, that could have been it. It's really hard on small companies and, you know, really under, um, you know, they're the ones who, who invested in all of that research and development to develop that product. And now they're being denied the gains from that and Amazon is essentially just stealing those gains. If this had really dinged up our business, like I know it does to so many others, Damn right I'd be pissed. Peter Daring started Peak Design 12 years ago. Today, it's got more than 200 products on shelves at Best Buy and REI and on Amazon, where he says it makes 12 to 15% of its $100 million in annual sales. I suppose if it's a retailer, that's our biggest retail partner. Amazon says third-party sellers make up more than 60% of its e-commerce business, $390 billion in sales, according to some estimates. Today, at a minimum, is 45 cents. 45% 45 of every dollar goes back to Amazon. Why would Amazon, who makes so much money on every dollar sold from a third-party seller, why would they bite the hand that feeds them in that way? Jason Boyce was a top seller on Amazon before he started his business consulting for 100-plus other sellers. Around 2008, he got a first-hand look into how Amazon can make such close copies of some bestsellers. I was invited to Amazon headquarters, my brother and I went, and we were asked to provide a proposal to get products made for Amazon's private labels. And they were pushing these product specification sheets to us and said, can you get this made? And how much can you get it made for? And uh, my brothers and I looked at each other and we're like, gosh, that, that's actually a third party seller's product on this page. Um, where did you guys get this information? Um, we had sales data information and they looked at each other the gentlemen in the room looked at each other and they kind of wink, wink. Oh, we have our ways of getting information. You know, Amazon has developed a lot of these private labels by gathering data, essentially spying on the companies that have to rely on its website in order to reach consumers. And so they're able to get a whole lot of insights about a huge number of products and then sort of systematically develop their own products to successfully compete. In September, the Attorney General of California sued Amazon for anti-competitive practices. In 2020, Congress questioned Jeff Bezos about it. So let me ask you, Mr. Bezos, does Amazon ever access and use third-party seller data when making business decisions? And just a yes or no will suffice, sir. Uh, but I can't answer that question, yes or no. What I can tell you is we have a policy against using seller-specific data uh, to aid our private label business, uh, but I can't 
guarantee you that that policy has never been violated. In a statement, Amazon told CNBC, we do not use data about individual sellers that isn't public to determine which private brand products to launch. And we have a policy to protect seller data that goes further than any other retailer we know of. It says that they only use aggregated data and not data on a single seller. Well, aggregated data by their definition can be as few as two companies selling something. Once Amazon has its own version of a popular product, it can also give it preferential treatment on its marketplace. Although this is nothing new. They will put it next to the national brand with whom they are trying to compete with a Me Too packaging, a similar look, etc. And they'll even have a big sign that says, buy basically the same product or better at 30% low price. So why is this decades old practice getting antitrust scrutiny now that Amazon's doing it? One of the big differences is data. You know, Amazon has an extraordinary amount of data across millions and millions of products. They also know what search terms people are using, what they're clicking on, how long their mouse is hovering in a certain place. And so they are able to analyze all of that data for a, a, a level of insights that simply is, you know, are not available to your typical chain retailer. Amazon also has far more power to steer shoppers to one product over another than a typical brick and mortar retailer. Their ability to take uh, one particular product and shove it on, you know, page 10 of the search results while giving, you know, another product, say their own product, lots of space right there on the first page of, of search results. You know, we know that really alters and steers buying behavior. The American Innovation and Choice Online Act, being considered by Congress, would crack down on big tech's ability to leverage dominant market power at the expense of small businesses, although it's yet to make it to a vote. In June, an Amazon executive encouraged third-party sellers to oppose the bill. One seller told CNBC, any informed seller is going to support massive action taken against Amazon in the antitrust arena, and that we are not morons and know how to read and think for ourselves. Amazon claims thousands of sellers have voiced concern about the bill in communications with members of Congress and said in a statement, we value the opinions of all of our selling partners and use their feedback to make Amazon an even better place for small businesses to succeed. In Europe, antitrust regulations on big tech have been far more successfully enforced. The European Union has fined Amazon and its cousins, other big tech companies, hundreds of millions of dollars, and it's just a line item to them. When you can push $600 billion in retail value of goods through one website in one year, what's a billion dollar fine? Still, in an effort to appease regulators, Amazon drastically reduced the number of private label items on its site in the first half of this year, according to a Wall Street Journal investigation. Executives, it found, were discussing exiting the private label business entirely to ease antitrust scrutiny. In a statement, Amazon told CNBC, we never seriously considered closing our private label business and we continue to invest in this area, just as our many retail competitors have done for decades and continue to do today. For Amazon, like others, private labels are a good opportunity with high margins. Target, for instance, told CNBC that 12 of its 48 owned brands are each now worth a billion dollars. Although Amazon doesn't share sales data on individual brands, Avenue 7 Media's internal data shows Amazon sells tens of millions of dollars worth of Basics batteries every month. I don't think that there's any credence to the fact that Amazon's sunsetting Amazon Basics products that are doing well. Now, are they calling the herd for products that are doing not so well? Absolutely, and any good business would do that. In some categories like skincare and mobile accessories, Amazon's private labels make up less than 1% of sales on Amazon.com compared to name brand goods. The category with the highest share of private label sales is TV and video at 38%. Think Amazon's own devices like the Fire TV. Next up is batteries at nearly 30%. But while batteries and other basics may be here to stay, Amazon remains under antitrust scrutiny from the Federal Trade Commission for its many recent acquisitions, from MGM to One Medical to iRobot. You want to have a democracy, you need to be able to prevent um, you know, private entities from amassing a lot of power and then using that power to push other people around, which is essentially what a monopoly is. Still, Amazon's knockoffs don't all succeed or overpower small businesses. With the everyday sling bag, Daring says Peak Design came out on top, thanks to all the bad press. Once their product plummeted from like a three and a half star product down to a one star product, they just took it off altogether. So they stopped selling it really quite quickly. Daring says he's changed one big thing since Amazon copied his bestseller, and it's his top piece of advice for other sellers wishing to keep Amazon from doing the same to them. We made it so that every single product that we make gets a design patent. It can't look like this. 
because ours already looks like this. So we get those full stop with every single product that we release now.